Okay, it works now. All right, so shall we start now? Yes, please, yes, yes. So welcome to the second 25th anniversary RGSL lecture. And uh, the first lecture has been delivered by the president of the, of the Latvian Republic. And the second is a lecture will be delivered by Stefan Auer. And uh, the title of the lecture is The Russian Invasion of Ukraine and the Limits of the EU Europe. Just a few words about RGSL. We are the small but very beautiful institution offering the top, uh, you know, top legal education on the undergraduate and the postgraduate level. If you will be in Riga, just drop in and uh, have a look or check our website. And this year we celebrate 25th anniversary. And as you know, the best way to celebrate anniversary quarter of the century is by the intellectual debate, by, by lecture, but, but uh, debate, uh, asking questions and uh, looking for some uh, <clears throat> new ideas. And uh, I ask Dr. Stefan, uh, Stefan Auer to give this lecture for a few reasons. Let me introduce the speaker. The Stefan Auer is associate professor at the University of Hong Kong and the twice named Jean Monnet Chair in European Union Studies. He has published an award-winning monograph, Liberal Nationalists in Central Europe, and published uh, plenty of articles in Government and Opposition, International Affairs, the Journal of Common Market Studies, and the West European Politics. But the jewel in the crown is his recent book, and I am just showing you the book, right? And the title of the book is European Disunion, Democracy, Sovereignty, and the Politics of Emergency. It's been published this year by Hearst and Company in London. Few words why I invited Stefan, for a few reasons. Not only because I knew him for a long, long time, from my point of view, taking into account my age, almost time immemorial, but uh, I was always struck by his uh, sort of the unconventional perception of European Union. And it seems to me that, that the lecture given by Stefan will steer some debates and discussion. Uh, in, it's not a, it's not a only critical approach to European Union, but he simply put to the points some problems faced by, by, by European Union. And uh, Stefan, I think that will be the, everything for my introduction. Now about the structure. It means I understand that you will talk for about 40, 45 minutes, and then there will be some time for Q&A. If you want to ask the questions, the first of all, you know, <clears throat> you know that uh, push the button and raise your hand, or if you don't want to speak, then simply write the question on the chat and we will read the question to, to, the, to our speaker. And uh, thank you very much. And Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Charnota. Thank you, Adam, for a very kind introduction and thanks for the invitation. In the first place, I have known uh, Professor Charnota for more than 20 years, as you mentioned, and I learned a great deal from you about the challenges of post-communist transformation, about Poland, about the rule of law, etc. One thing that you didn't mention that we have in common is that we are both Australian, but originally from Central Europe. If you wonder about my accent, it, it is Slavic. I am from Czechoslovakia or the Slovak Republic. So my perspectives are, are Central European, if you want, but also Australian. Let me start. And, and may I just say also that you should feel free to, to interrupt me if, if you want to ask questions even during my presentation, because 40 minutes is quite long for, for this format. Let me start. At the beginning of old Europe, of, at the beginning of old Europe's end was the Zeitenwende. Everyone talks about the Zeitenwende now. It's a German word that the Prime Minister of Germany, Olaf Scholz, introduced into the debate. And the word stands for the realization that the Russian invasion of Ukraine on February 24th, 2022, marked a radical break in European history. Nothing is as it once was. That's the meaning, that's the gist of a momentous speech that the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz presented to the German Bundestag, the parliament just three days after the war started. And I think it's significant that he addressed 
but there is the Bundestag, at least the house of German democracy, and you need to justify a radical new position that Germany and Europe adopted in response to the Russian war. And you, you see the relevant passage there, the opening words, the world afterwards will no longer be the same as the world before. The issue at the, at the heart of this is whether power is allowed to prevail over the law. Whether we permit Putin to turn back to the clock, to turn back the clock to the 19th century and the age of the great powers, or whether we have it in us to keep warmongers like Putin in check. That requires strength of our own. And this Zeitenwende, of course, is perhaps best characterized by, by the colors of the Ukrainian flag, of course, which one can see on display in many European capitals. I, I, I saw that, that there are even, even uh, yes, I, I, I saw that, uh, well, this is Brussels, but I saw that there are even, of course, in, in Riga, not surprisingly. As I said, nothing is as it once was. And we could add that we are yet to see whether it will ever be again as it used to be. Will we be able to restore our belief in a world in which the law ultimately prevails over brute power? This was one of the questions that animated the first lecture in this series by the distinguished speaker who addressed you last month, and I listened to it, the president of Latvia, Egils Levitz, who spoke about the problem of Russia's international accountability. That is about the possibility and desirability of international law. But I want to step back a bit and I want to ask kind of bigger questions about the relationship between power and violence. To use Scholz's vocabulary, the question, the answer to which will determine Europe's future for a long time to come is, will we gather enough strength? And who is we in this question, of course? It's obviously the people of Ukraine and their armed forces, but their success requires Western support. And we are yet to see whether it's going to be sufficient. So that, Adam, you kindly mentioned uh, my book and, and the book actually came out last year uh, and I wrote most of it uh, before the war started. And I had the opportunity to write short kind of afterward, uh, there is author's note at the very end. And then I reflected on the fact that the title itself might be misleading now because immediately after the war, there seemed a great deal of unity that determined European politics. And, and I'm focusing on the forces of fragmentation in Europe. So I, I, I want to kind of uh, reflect on it, expand on, on my findings in the book. And my worry since the beginning of this conflict, and that is a worry that I articulated in those last few pages of the book, is that, that we, that Europe, and the collective West have been doing enough to prevent Ukraine's defeat, but not enough to enable its victory. This is what the limits of EU Europe alludes to in my title. There is a limit as to how much the EU is able and willing to do for Ukraine. And there is also potentially a limit as to how far the EU can and will go to incorporate Ukraine and other countries in its eastern neighborhood as full members. So another aspect I want to discuss a bit is the prospect of enlargement. Even once the war is over and Ukraine prevail, right? And, and that is a big if, of course. It is far from self-evident that it will become a full member of the EU soon enough for it to be truly worthwhile for Ukraine's transformation and European transformation. So the danger is very real. The danger is very real that Ukraine, with the support of the collective West, could win the war and lose the peace. Back to Scholz though. What he said resonated strongly in Germany and across Western Europe, particularly France, where the shock about the full-blown invasion was all the greater as the efforts to negotiate with Putin's Russia were pursued until just, until just a few days before the war started. From the perspective of many people in Central and Eastern Europe, and I don't think I need to spend much time explaining that to you. Uh, the outbreak of the war and the extent of brutality were shocking, but not all that surprising. Many people in Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and I suspect in Latvia too, were worried whether the German dramatic change in rhetoric was too little too late. 
And more than a year later, we are yet to see how to answer that question. So I'll focus quite, quite a bit on uh, Germany. It's a country I know uh, best perhaps, uh, but also it's one of the most important players in, in the EU, there is no doubt about that. So was it too little too late? After all, when you think about Putin's Russia and his relationship to Ukraine, it has attempted to turn back the clock to the 19th century and the age of great powers for two decades. And again, as I don't need to remind you, the war in Ukraine goes back to 2014, right? To make things worse, Germany required another year or so to follow this strong rhetoric with strong deeds. And that takes me to, to another point that is kind of the key point of the whole lecture. Timothy Gatonesh popularized the notion that emerged in Ukraine, I understand, and that is this one, Holtzing. Those of you who are on Twitter would have seen that, of course. A meme invented by Ukrainians, which, is, which stands for communicating good intentions, only to use, find, invent any reason imaginable to delay these and or prevent them from happening. And you know what this is about? It is about uh, Germany's hesitation to provide Ukraine uh, with help, with military equipment, etc. One of the questions I want to raise, though, is whether the EU as a whole is guilty of Schultzing. That is the kind of innovative and bold claim that I want to put forward here. Whether the EU as a whole is guilty of Schultzing when it comes to its dealing with Ukraine. And this has been happening, in my view, in two ways, short-term and long-term. Short-term, of course, it's all about military support. If Europeans truly delivered on its initial promises as early as some of the EU leaders voiced them, the war might have been long over by now. Does anyone remember the EU's foreign minister promising to deliver fighter jets to Ukraine? Seriously, does anyone remember that? It was quite a while ago. It happened just three days after the outbreak of the war. Right? Joseph Borrell, on February the 27th, said EU countries will send fighter jets to Ukraine at Kiev's request. We are going to provide even fighting jets. We are not talking about just ammunition. We are providing more important arms to go to a war. And the problem is, as it soon became obvious, that the EU has no jets, no weapons, no military capabilities. In fact, and you are students of law, of European politics, it won't surprise you when I say that the EU does not even have a foreign minister. Joseph Borrell is high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, not its foreign minister, for the simple reason that the EU is not a state, right? So the EU is not a military actor. A lot has happened since then, and the EU has adopted measures that would have been unimaginable before the war. But we are yet to see whether this will be enough for Ukraine to prevail. At any rate, the EU has never been and still is not a major military actor. And its support in this is of necessity, rather limited. Someone has the mic on, and you should feel free to, to, to raise a question. Uh, but if you don't have a question, it's probably better to, to switch off the mic. If Russia is defeated, and that's a big if, it will be thanks to the courage of Ukrainians and its military, the support they have received from NATO and powerful nation states, the US, of course, firstly, the United Kingdom, Poland, Germany, even far away Australia provided weapons to Ukraine. And yes, even the EU. But Europe's means in this area are constrained, seriously constrained. And this takes me to the second point that might seem less pressing right now, but it is not less important, far from it. Medium long term. This is about the promises that the EU has made to bring Ukraine into the European family. That's a term that Ursula von der Leyen in particular seems to like a lot. As a fully fledged member of the European Union. And the importance of this cannot be underestimated. 
The EU enlargement, of course, has long been considered as the EU's most successful foreign policy tool. I wonder, though, whether it is still all that effective. So the EU can't win the war. We established that. It's not a military actor. But it would be a horrible tragedy if Ukraine were to win the war but lose the peace. What do I mean by this? Ukraine faces two existential challenges. The first, the most obvious one, is to win the war, to win back its territorial integrity as a sovereign state. The second, though, is to secure and maintain peace, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. And for that second aim, uh, the U European Union and the Ukraine's membership in the European Union is, is hugely important. Only through the full membership in the EU, Ukraine's long-term future can be safeguarded. And it is in, the relation, in relation to the second challenge that the EU can have its greatest impact. So the EU can't win the war, right? It's not a military actor, but it must, it must win uh, the peace. So I am back to these first few days immediately after the outbreak of the war. And remember, Kiev was, was uh, uh, being surrounded, right? Uh, uh, remember that it required immense courage by the leader, uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky, to, to stay in Kiev. And so four days after the full-blown invasion of Ukraine, uh, President signed uh, the, the request for full membership application, right? Ukraine submitted its application for a full membership in the European Union, February the 28th. One day after that famous Zeitenwende speech, one day after uh, Joseph Borrell promised fighter jets to Ukraine, Ukraine officially requested full membership of the European Union. And it took less than four months for the European Council on 23rd of June 2022 last year acting on the commission's recommendation, granted Ukraine the status of a candidate for EU membership. Again, completely unprecedented, right? It never happened so fast. It was emblematic of the EU's strong support for Ukraine in the face of Russia's illegal and unprovoked war of aggression. The speed of that was unprecedented, right? Really significant. And, and make no mistake, was it not for the war, it would not have happened. Like Ukraine has had aspiration for full membership and it was kind of ignored. And that takes me to one of the kind of big academic debates I, I want to draw on. And that is the gap between EU's capability, capabilities and the expectations that EU raises. And that takes me back to a classic article that I would recommend you all study, highly relevant, exactly 30 years ago. I mean, you know, uh, as a fellow academic, I mean, oh, that we are still debating Christopher Hill's uh, path-breaking article on the capability expectations gap or conceptualizing Europe's international role. The article was very prescient in many ways. But it failed in one important respect. Like many EU scholars, and in fact, many West European politicians, Christopher Hill massively underestimated Russia. So I, I, I like the article because it's really quite uh, skeptical about EU's ambitions. And he talked about the European community. It was about to become the European Union. The Treaty of Maastricht was yet to be ratified. He, he was very skeptical about the EU's ambitions to, to be a major international actor. But even his assessment, uh, in hindsight, proved uh, overly optimistic. But the main problem is, that's relevant today, that he massively underestimated Russia. He notes that the Soviet Union has disappeared and believes that a G3 world was emerging. Again, would anyone guess which, the, which were the three countries or three entities that would dominate the world, G3? Mm. Would anyone have a go at it? Which were the three major powers in 
1993. So of course it's the United States, right? But the other two, I, I doubt that anyone would have guessed correctly. He talks about Europe, okay, he's a Europeanist. And then he talks about Japan, Japan. No China is mentioned, no Russia. The disappearance of the Soviet Union, Russia doesn't figure, doesn't loom large either. either. And though Hill was prescient in being skeptical towards some outlandish claims about the EU's power as a global actor, he was still way too optimistic. In particular, the EU has failed to live up to Hill's vision as a mediator of conflict. So the article uh, provides you with a very, very extensive kind of list of tasks that the EU would be very well suited to do. And one that is particularly relevant to the war in Ukraine is EU as a mediator of conflict. In Hill's view, the EU's strength as a mediator would derive from its possession, and I quote, of the singular advantage of not being perceived as a superpower and potential hegemon. Now, the, the irony, of course, in relation to Russia is that the EU has managed to be perceived as a potential hegemon without having power to protect Ukraine, right? So Ukraine ended up getting the worst of both worlds. The EU was powerful enough to upset Russia, but not powerful enough to protect Ukraine's sovereignty. I mean, this is actually something that, that Merzheimer have, uh, has argued, and I, I don't support his argument. I actually discussed it in a 2015 article in International Affairs. But, but that point uh, that Merzheimer presents does give us, does give us uh, a glimpse of the Russian perspective of, of the uh, matter, right? So I disagree with Merzheimer, just as I disagree with Putin or Medvedev, but it gives us a good insight into the Russian thinking on, on the matter, right? And that is that, that Russia felt uh, that uh, the Europe was pushing too far by seeking to incorporate, incorporate uh, Ukraine. So it's really quite the reverse of what uh, Christopher Hill expected, right? The, the, the EU is going to have had that advantage of not being perceived as a superpower. Uh, and, and yet it was exactly perceived as a potential hegemon without having effective power to protect Ukraine. You know, one of the tragedies of Ukraine is that it is captured in its name, as, as, you, as you are no doubt aware of that, that it, it means uh, in, in Russian, like the in-between land and that Ukraine has found itself in between these two major powers, the West, the EU on the one side and, and Russia on, on the other. And that brings me back to EU, Ukraine uh, and, and, and the two uh, turning points, right? As I said, the war has not really started just on February 24, 2022. You really need to go back to the revolution of dignity, to the Maidan movement in, in 2014. And, and there the tragedy is, of course, that the Maidan movement succeeded by reclaiming dignity to Ukrainian nation. President Viktor Yanukovych was defeated, a pro-Russian president, right? But Russia was not. Putin's Russia was able to occupy Crimea and support its separatist forces, separatist forces in Donbass. So back then that didn't lead to a Titan Vende, even though initially there was also a strong sense of unity in Europe and sanctions were imposed on, on Russia, but Germany, the leading power of Europe, uh, soon defied those sanctions. Uh, so uh, uh, that invasion, that occupation of Crimea didn't lead to a Titan Vende, but Nord Stream 2, a project initiated in 2015. So I want to juxtapose two pictures to show how much the perception of the EU and Ukraine changed between these two years. This is 2014, February. Fast forward eight years, February too, and this is a gathering in the Verkhovna Rada. As you see, like just, just days, two weeks before the outbreak of the war. And there was a strong sense that there was an imminent danger of, of war, not in France, not in Germany. President Macron, Prime Minister Olaf Scholz were still begging Putin to, to be uh, reasonable, right? 
So, you, you know, I, I like this picture and I discuss it often with my students in, in Hong Kong. What does it show, right? The, the center is the EU flag and then, and then Ukrainian flags, right? So it was an attempt of Ukrainians to return to Europe, to the rightful uh, destiny. That was what the revolution of dignity uh, was all about, right? Fast forward eight years. What flags do we see? It's Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States, even the Czech Republic, Poland, not surprisingly, NATO, even Turkey. The flags that are conspicuous by absence, of course, are France, Germany, and the EU, because they were seen rightly as being too accommodating towards Putin. So we are back to Scholz, right? Back to Scholz. And this is, this is what causes uh, my concerns. When you look at French and German responses more closely, it is perhaps surprising to see how much continuity there is rather than radical change announced by the Seitenbender, right? Again, I, I'll focus on, on Germany. Every step over the last year and a half, German leadership had to be dragged by its European partners to do more than the bare minimum. And of course, Poland in particular was very active in that. Just one, one recent example for many. When Germany generously offered to send Patriot missiles uh, to Poland, and these are very sophisticated uh, weapons, right? The, the Polish government ungratefully embarrassed its benefactor by suggesting that they should be offered to Ukraine instead. So that was a major diplomatic spat, right? The gesture seemed uh, really not just impolite, but, but ugly even foolish. And yet the spat was eventually resolved to the advantage of Ukraine, which received the sophisticated defense system a few weeks ago and reported its first major success just a few days ago when it shot down uh, first one and then many more Russian hyper, uh, hypersonic missile missiles flying over Kiev. So great news for Ukraine, for Ukrainian patriots and the West. So Ukrainian patriots using patriot defense system where it is most needed and showing off the superiority of the U.S. technology in the process. So get great news for Ukraine and the collective West. But this is not an attempt to have yet another go at Olaf Scholz and the never-ending infatuation that the post-Second World War West Germany continues to have with Russia. And there is a strong constituency of, uh, in favor of a more accommodating approach to Russia in Germany. What I try to do is to engage with some of the major perspectives on contemporary European politics and history. So I really don't want to just kind of engage in, in German bashing. And in fact, I, I watched the ceremony on the weekend. Uh, President Zelensky was awarded a prestigious Aachen uh, Award for uh, uh, great Europeans. And, and again, uh, uh, Chancellor Scholz gave a moving speech, and the things are moving, the Zeitenwende is becoming uh, very real. What, what I want to now uh, uh, move to is a kind of working hypothesis that, that I'm curious to get uh, uh, feedback on. I, I want to present the heretic view of, of the EU that is kind of touched on in, in the book, but not fully uh, uh, fleshed out. Uh, and you know, the, the, just to put it in the context, this is this is the book, right? And it's a it's an accident that the the blue and yellow, of course, which stand for the European Union, invoke now, uh, obviously, uh, Ukraine too. So, most scholars I find, however radical the change in Europe is, feel that their views have been vindicated. So Fukuyama, of course, doesn't talk that much about uh, the end of history, but. He still is of strong belief that liberalism prevails, but when looking at Ukraine, he stresses the importance of nationhood, and that I, I, I respect, right? I, I share that, that uh, perspective. Uh, you look at Timothy Gatonesh, another internationalist liberal whom I respect greatly. He sees the emergence of the kind of Europe that uh, liberals have always wanted, right? With Ukraine's help. And not surprisingly, of course, I, I mentioned already 
John Mersheimer, who is convinced that the war has vindicated his hard-headed realism that enabled him to predict the war perhaps better than anyone. And I could name others. It's a pity that Samuel Huntington is no longer alive, uh, the author of The uh, Clash of Civilization, and, and uh, he would feel vindicated too, even though he, he does not expect, he did not expect wars between uh, uh, from within civilizations, but yet he, he uh, depicted Russia as a kind of torn civilization. So you can find passages that would that would vindicate his approach too. I don't want to make uh, kind of the same assumption just to say that everything that I have written over the last 20 or 30 years uh, proved correct. I actually want to revise some of my views. And, 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 and the one that, that uh, uh, keeps me busy is uh, the meaning of 1989. Have we, have we misunderstood the significance of 1989 and its relevance? To contemporary Europe. So like 10 years after, after the collapse of communism, 10, 20 years after the collapse of communism, I, I published a series of essays celebrating the fact that uh, this is a new paradigm of revolutionary change. You know, exactly 200 years after the French Revolution, we have nonviolent revolutions, a radical break accomplished by nonviolent means. So I, like many other liberals, was enthusiastic about the possible of nonviolent power which underpinned my understanding of the legacy of 1989 revolutions. And of course, then I also understand that the EU uh, uh, understandably, uh, you know, appropriated that legacy. And, and this is a quote from, from my book, that the EU loves nonviolent revolutions. It sees its, it, its own beauty reflected in them because the EU defines itself as a nonviolent power. But what I'm talking about is the limit of that nonviolent power when confronted with Russia. So here goes my her heretical hypothesis uh, or, or a series of, of tricky questions. And, and that uh, approach to 1989 or the understanding of nonviolent power or nonviolent revolutions, I trace back and many others did to Hannah Arendt, right, who, who wrote, uh, um, who developed powerful insights in, in the relationship between power and violence. In fact, he, she viewed power and violence as opposites where the one rules absolutely, the other is absent. But my heretical, disturbing kind of questions are whether we've been too nice to our enemies in 1989 and after. There's a beautiful essay that uh, Timothy Gato Nash wrote citing Martin Kroll. Uh, he, he, Martin Kroll, the Polish intellectual, wrote something like, were we all stupid then, you know, in 1989? I'm pushing it even a bit further. Have you been too nice to our enemies? Was the paradigm of the nonviolent revolution too nice to be truthful? And were Arendt and me, emulating Arendt, wrong to think of power as the opposite of violence when looking at 1989? And again, so in the European context, that conception of power was very influential and, and very successful. Of course, the the great intellectual, the, the kind of, uh, uh, the, the most distinguished sociologist, public intellectual, philosopher, uh, Jürgen Habermas, he can be seen as the philosopher of the European unity in some uh, ways. He thought of, of, of uh, peace being uh, safeguarded and accomplished through conversation. That's a dismissive kind of account by David Martin Jones, but it captures the essence of that project, right? Uh, you know, basically, if you talk to each other for, for uh, long enough, the conflicting parties will get so bored and tired uh, that they will give up and find a compromise solution to overcome their hostilities. And to be fair to Habermas, he has steadfastly maintained his suspicion of military means to, to, to solve conflict. So he is an oddball, actually, right now in Germany. There is, uh, amongst uh, intellectuals, a great deal of enthusiasm for support of Ukraine. Habermas remains uh, wary of it. So the EU moved further away from itself, of course, but it is still neither here nor there. I, I wonder whether I could alter there with Martin Jones' uh, kind of dismissive metaphor, and we could say that the EU has now embarked on the pursuit of war through conversation. The key actors, and I am talking about Joseph Borrell 
the quasi foreign minister of Ukraine, but Ursula von der Leyen to Charles Michel. Those key actors seem to uh, begin to outcompete each other in the declarations of allegiance to Ukraine and its valiant effort to repel the invasion. So just a couple of quotes, right? And they all went to Kiev, of course, Ursula von der Leyen a number of times. Charles Michel, January the 20th this year, I have come to Ukraine to tell you we are all Ukrainian. Ukraine is the EU and the EU is Ukraine. We must spare no effort to turn this promise into reality as fast as we can. I admire the spirit, but what worries me is that it is yet another example of, of the growing discrepancy between aspirations and uh, capabilities. Now look at this one, Ursula von der Leyen. Ukrainians are ready to die for the European perspective. We want them to live with us, the European dream. Again, you look at the EU literature, even about European identity, and one of the points that people make who are skeptical about the possibility of turning the EU into a quasi super state is that no one is going to die for Europe. So seeing Ukrainians fighting for Ukraine and Europe is exciting uh, for these uh, leaders. And Joseph Borrell, right? He didn't just say he will uh, deliver, that the EU will deliver fighter jets to Ukraine. Uh, more recently, he said if Russian army would be, uh, uh, you know, would resort to, to nuclear weapons, Russian army would be annihilated, 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 right? Again, who is Joseph Borrell to make such outlandish uh, statements, such outlandish uh, uh, promises? So what worries me is that the most likely scenario of uh, uh, Ukraine's future in relation to the EU is the one that is least desirable, that the expectation capabilities gap will widen even further and undermine EU's credibility in the process. I believe that only a radically changed European Union would be able to accommodate Ukraine as a full member. But since there is no appetite for any serious change of EU governing structures, the prospects for Ukraine membership are, are not that great, are slim. And even this is predicated on some kind of peace settlement. And so then uh, we, we could go through, through some of the ideas of uh, uh, what the EU uh, is or what it should be, right? So the EU moved away or is moving away from the idea of being the quiet, superpower of, of uh, being a kind of non-violent power and, and the classic formulations come from Andrew Moravchik. The most recent one is only uh, uh, three years old. So that exuberance about the EU having found a new model of governance uh, has, has dissipated quite uh, dramatically. Because we live in a Europe uh, that has to accept that its founding premise the cherished conviction, as Ivan Krastyev put it very convincingly, three days again after the start of the war, Europe's cherished conviction that economic interdependence is the best guarantee for peace has turned out to be wrong. It worked very well within Europe, but it, it uh, failed completely in relationship to its eastern neighborhood. So that Europe has no longer much credibility because that Europe worked in a world that no longer exists, right? A world of, of uh, stability, peace, and international uh, cooperation. That is where soft power works. But with revisionist powers, like Russia asserting its power by violent means, this is no longer good enough, right? We are all living in Putin's world now, again, citing Ivan Krastyev. This is the most depressing picture I find on, on my slides and there too you can see when you look very closely uh, the EU uh, logo on that key ring, right? The EU was not strong enough there to protect that, that victim that you can also see. So what, what is, how is the EU going to change? How it is going to, to respond? As I, as I said, we, we uh, have seen the limits of soft power, but uh, what we have not uh, seen yet is how how those limits could be overcome and that takes me to the bigger debate and i will just uh, finish by uh, sketching out that uh, that uh, uh, debate and that is what is 
uh, the European Union because you have conflicting proposals on the table uh, about the EU. I mean, I mentioned Jürgen Habermas who thinks of a post-national uh, Europe. Uh, the, the talk about postmodern Europe, I don't think is all that relevant. Uh, people like my esteemed uh, former colleague, Bridget Lafan, talks about experimental union, a good metaphor because Europe has always been evolving. A post-sovereign Europe, students of law would know uh, what I'm talking about, right? Uh, Neil McCormick pointed out that sovereignty moved from, uh, uh, was taken away from the nation states, but but disappeared, right? Uh, it has it's not been reconstituted at the EU uh, level. And I believe that all these accounts uh, uh, no longer help us because we live in the age of emergency, in the age of war, where sovereignty suddenly becomes more relevant in that more old fashioned sense. And I'm drawn back to, to authors like Carl Schmitt, not a nice person, uh, a, a Nazi, uh, not only a Nazi sympathizer, but a major actor, but a, but a profound thinker of politics and, and, and law. And he defines sovereign as the one who decides on the exception. And we know who decided on the exception in Ukraine so far. It's uh, Putin and it's the Ukrainian uh, army, right, with the help uh, of the West. But so all of this is fundamentally challenging the EU's self-understanding, right? The underpinning uh, rationale or the underpinning conviction, ideology, that you can uh, establish and maintain peace through interdependence, right? And that you can export that model outside of, of uh, Europe. And the Germans have this, this concept of, of uh, uh, Wandel durch Handel, right? The transformation uh, uh, through trade. This, this has, has uh, basically uh, failed, right? So uh, uh, what you have are conflicting proposals how to go forward. Uh, President Macron talks about a sovereign Europe that would be more unified and um, empowered also militarily. Prime Minister Scholz echoes somewhat uh, these proposals by stressing the importance of abolishing uh, the uh, re requirement for unanimity in common foreign affairs and security policies. Uh, but but the, the approach uh, taken by Poland, I find the most convincing one, even though it's least likely uh, to, to, to persuade Pol uh, uh, Germany and France and therefore uh, succeed, and that is that, that Europe needs to uh, 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 return, at least to some extent, to nation states, because what the war has also shown is that nation states uh, matter. They were the main actors in assisting uh, Ukraine. And I think that the Prime Minister Morawiecki was right to say that if in recent years, Europe had always acted as Germany wanted, and this is what, what uh, uh, not without justification, uh, the countries in the nations in Central and Eastern Europe fear a, a Franco-German-led Europe without a unanimity requirement. Uh, 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 would be one in which uh, smaller countries have less say. So if in recent years, Europe had always acted as Germany wanted, would we be in a better or worse situation today? And of course the answer, it's a rhetorical question, so Morawiecki's answer is, is uh, uh, that it would be worse off because, because that, that ideological commitment to Wandel durch Handel, to, to uh, transformation through trade, uh, was too strong and ignored the fact that Russia was becoming a, a mortal danger to, to Europe. So back to, to Scholzing and, and expectations uh, and capabilities uh, gap. In this context, so, so uh, in this context, the outlandish rhetoric of major actors like von der Leyen, Charles Michel and Joseph Borrell is nothing but reckless. Excited to see that at long last, there are actually people willing to die for the European Union. They fail to notice that such an EU doesn't exist and is not going to emerge in foreseeable future. So I, I hope there are enough uh, provocative statements there to, to trigger a discussion. And I hope I didn't talk for too long, Adam? No, not for too long. Thanks, Stefan, and uh, for this to the force. And uh, 
what I like actually in your talk, uh, doesn't mean that I agree with everything, but uh, later on, is that uh, this taking into account the empirical details and at the same time formulation of the almost historiosophical, you know, uh, thesis, right? And the main issue, from my point of view, anyway, is uh, is an issue of relation between the between the uh, power and and violence as a as a theoretician. And I hope that we could touch that later on in the discussion. And uh, the model or the form of a future European Union. Uh, what I question actually here is a uh, is a uh, attitude actually to European Union as a on the one hand sort of unity almost that 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 you you don't take into account the conflicting interests right and i don't think that the we can reduce all those uh, uh, conflict of interest only to the states so the question to my question to you but later on i will open the floor to everybody before is that can we identify some other layers of the conflict of interest within the european union not reducible to the conflict between the particular member states but uh, having said that i just opened the, now the floor to the discussion to everybody and uh, please uh, raise your hand or write a question or comment on the you know on the chat I don't see now the brave people. <laughs> don't, don't, be, don't be afraid. <laughs> there are yeah, no, 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 there are no wrong it's questions. Just, right. just really friendly type of discussion. And uh, so can you, Stefan? Uh, yeah, there is, there is a hand that was raised. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, Arini? Okay, yes. Um, hi. Actually, it's not a, a question, but I would like to ask if you could talk a little bit more about uh, John Marsauer's article, Why the Ukraine Crisis is the West Fault, because I didn't understand if he's criticizing uh, the Russian perspective of, or he's in favor of this perspective. And that, that's it. Thank you. Yes, I'm very happy to talk about John Mersheimer. He's, he's uh, an interesting figure and hugely influential. I can actually tell you that uh, after the takeover of Crimea, I made one and only visit to Beijing, to mainland China. I was invited to quite, a, uh, quite an impressive gathering. Uh, representatives from uh, the Chinese foreign ministry, uh, think tankers from uh, Beijing, uh, but a major, major think tank, and then some fellow French uh, journalists, academics, and, and one or two academics from uh, Hong Kong. And we talked about uh, Russia and the EU. And uh, I was astonished, actually, that my Chinese counterparts cited Merzheimer and, and challenged my views of, of the Maidan movement and the revolution of dignity uh, by citing Merzheimer. So he is probably more popular in Beijing and Moscow than, than in Brussels or in, in Washington. And, and for the reason that he is, in fact, he seems quite sympathetic towards Russia. So he's not that critical of that Nash Russian narrative. But, but to be fair to him, I mean, I, I'm not the one who, like, like there are people on, on Twitter and social media who, who would want to ban uh, Merzheimer. I, I watched him giving a two hour talk and discussion at the European University Institute last year. And I would strongly encourage you to, to watch it because it's, it's very interesting. He's a sophisticated thinker. I believe he's profoundly wrong. He's profoundly wrong. But he has some insights that uh, we need to deal uh, with. I think he's wrong because he denies uh, the Ukrainian people agency, right? That was also the misassessment of the Ma Maidan movement that, that I argued about with my Chinese counterparts in uh, 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 Beijing, that they imagined that all these revolutions only ever happen because the US engineers them, instigates them, right? So uh, the Ukrainian people 
rebelled against Yanukovych because the US made them uh, uh, do so. And I think that is a, a massive misjudgment. There were similar arguments made about the democratic movement here in Hong Kong. And, and I can tell you from, from experience and talking to many of my students and going to many of those uh, gatherings that I was just completely uh, uh, fabricated. It wasn't the US that generated the movement. Having said that, it would be foolish to deny that both the EU and the US, uh, you know, had, had some presence. The, the very existence of the European Union was perceived by certain Russians as a, as a threat, right? And, and NATO enlargement certainly was perceived by many Russians, even by some Russian liberals as a threat. So, so it, I don't think it's helpful to deny it. And, and I think that Merzheimer is useful in uh, reminding us of that. Another thing I would say in defense of Merzheimer is that that realist perspective that, that uh, sophisticated scholars of European integration and all that frown upon, right? Because uh, it seems so old fashioned, right? It's about states being the key actors or the EU as a kind of supranational state in the making and, and, and their desire for preservation kind of dictating the logic of international relations. So that seems a very simplistic scheme. And yet, uh, in a world that we live in, that approach to international relations uh, is increasingly uh, useful uh, and if, for nothing else than uh, for our understanding of how China and Russia uh, uh, view the world. Uh, as I said, uh, Merzheimer is, is very popular there. So I don't know whether that answered your, your question. I don't support Merzheimer, but I uh, find him very interesting. And, and he's also a great orator, actually. I admire his presentation skills. He's a very accomplished writer and a great orator. The problem with very accomplished writers and great orators is that they can be profoundly wrong and uh, you don't always see that. <laughs> so that's my view. Thank you very much. Any other question, comments? There is a someone. Adrian, Adrian raised his hand. Yeah, I have two questions. One is regarding the soft power and uh, second. You want regarding... to turn on the camera? I, I will see you. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I already turned on. Good. Yeah, so my fir uh, first question regarding the soft power. You, so. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that there is the lack of soft power in the status quo world. And my question is, uh, how can the soft power be effectively utilized uh, to promote uh, peaceful negotiations between the countries? That's a brilliant question. And to be honest, the, that is the question. And I, I, I don't pretend to have an answer. The, this is the thing that, that bothers me, really. Like, uh, I don't know, right? If we no longer have the prospect of, of recreating a more peaceful international order in which you can deploy trade for transformation, that is the German paradigm, right? What kind of world are we going to live in? I, I, I don't know. Then I, I am a bit torn, to be honest. I, 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 that's a, a trivial personal uh, uh, observation. I started relearning uh, Russian. I had to learn Russian as a high school student at the university in communist Czechoslovakia. And Slovak is a Slavic language. So even in terms of distance, I'm more likely to master Russian in the next five years than Chinese, right? Uh, so I thought I, I should learn more Russian to understand, to better understand what's going on. But I don't know whether I will live long enough to visit Russia, right? I don't know whether I will live long enough to see a reemergence of a more decent Russia, the kind of Russia that uh, many of us believed uh, was in the making in the 1990s before, before Putin uh, uh, took over, right? Uh, uh, but so if we don't get that kind of more... Uh, liberal, democratic, more civilized, if you want to use a, an outdated category, uh, Russia, then we will live in a world where uh, military uh, power matters again. We will live in a world that is potentially 
far better described by the likes of John Mersheimer or Samuel Huntington than Jürgen Habermas. You know what I'm getting at? So I don't know that I'm giving you an answer because that's where I'm kind of torn. I mean, I was always suspicious of these uh, celebratory accounts of Europe and its soft power. And you can see that in, in my book, if you are interested, but all the essays too, I, I, I published an essay in 2010, uh, rubbishing Habermas. So I admire again his sophistication, but I think he is wrong. He underestimates this kind of old fashioned uh, power. But uh, I am not looking forward to a world uh, where, uh, yeah, the, the countries are divided between these uh, hostile blocks, right? There will be China and, and Russia on the one side and then Europe and the United States on the other side. And, and uh, we don't know what borders Ukraine might uh, reemerge in, et cetera. So not a nice prospect. Uh, so a liberal world order would be vastly preferable, but whether and how it can be restored, I don't know. Right now, I think it is absolutely crucial that the West takes the, the mortal danger that Russia represents seriously and, and strengthens its military capabilities. That is where Germany's performance has been disappointing, frankly. I, I watched the speech in the Bundestag. I lived in, in Germany in Cologne for six years, I speak German fairly well. I certainly understand everything. So I watched the speech and I found it uh, really, really uh, amazing. And, and then nothing much followed after that, right? So uh, uh, like many other observers of German politics, I was very disappointed. Now again, I have a bit more hope, but everything will be decided in Ukraine. If Ukraine is unable to really push back Russia, then uh, Europe is going to be in the shadow of that reinvigorated ah, revanchist power, you know, it's not a nice prospect. It's potentially more volatile and more dangerous than the Cold War that I grew up in. But I make a comment to the yeah. to both of you actually. And uh, <clears throat> in 1968 in, in Paris, there was a graffiti and the comment is to the relation of the soft power and violence, right? It means that graffiti was a little bit of violence, never harm anybody. The end of my comment. But now, Stefan, we've got a two questions on the on the chat. It means is a question from Enia. Why did Joseph Borrell say that the EU will help to provide Ukrainians with fighting jets if EU did not have any of them? Was that just a bluff or an act of pressure given by nation? So that, that's the one question. That's a very good, very, very good question. Very good question. And I, I think I can deal with it quite, quite quickly. I mean, I could just say that Borrell was stupid to do that, <laughs> uh, but that's a bit harsh. Uh, I would just say he was reckless. He was reckless. Uh, it was not completely outlandish in his view because the idea was, the hope was something that then happened about a year later, that the EU would enable the countries who are willing to provide fighter jets uh, to Ukraine, that the EU would support them, uh, uh, compensating them financially, etc. And that is roughly what has happened now over the last couple of months. Of course, Slovakia, Poland sent their uh, mix to to. Uh, uh, Ukraine. But at the very beginning of the war, uh, there was great anxiety even by the US leadership about that leading to escalation. And so Poland uh, early on seemed to have signaled that they would send uh, uh, the uh, the fighter jets, but then there wasn't enough support by NATO. And, and so the whole idea uh, disappeared. So it was just reckless. I mean, for someone who is described as the chief diplomat of the European Union, Joseph Borrell uh, has been really reckless, but to me, he represents that problem. I want to write a, a journal article about, about this, uh, that problem that the EU has, right? Expectations and capabilities uh, gap, you know, because people then, uh, then tell me, so I, I, I have the reputation probably uh, uh, well earned that I'm somewhat, somewhat uh, skeptical about some of the aspects of the the European Union and, and the scholarship is dominated by people who are just very enthusiastic about the 
EU. And so then people would tell me, well, well, of course the EU has no military capability, but I'm not saying that it has military capability. Joseph Borrell is doing that, right? By making such outlandish promises. So I, I, I think it was reckless. And, and in a situation that Ukraine was in, uh, I don't think it was helpful. His uh, probably justification would have been that by saying it, it would make it happen, but he didn't make it happen. It took another year of negotiations uh, in which Borrell probably played very little uh, uh, role. So it was a bluff, yes, uh, 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 rather reckless. Should we check the other question, Adam? Yes, please. There is another question from Victoria Tomasevicha. Mm -hmm. yes. There was a statement from European part from some officials that EU should take all steps as fast as it possible to accept Ukraine into EU. EU is ready. In the, what yeah. about Ukraine? Is Ukraine ready from the perspective to be a part of yeah. such a union? Yeah. So this is, again, I mean, th there I have a kind of similar criticism that I just voiced against uh, Borrell, right? That I, I don't find this outlandish rhetoric helpful. I understand where it comes from, because, I mean, it's impossible not to be emotional, right? And Zelensky gives a speech uh, to the European Parliament, or as he did in Aachen. It's impossible not to be emotional. But when Charles Michel in Kiev on January 20th, I had that slide there, says, I've come to Ukraine to tell you we are all Ukrainian. Ukraine is the EU and the EU is Ukraine. What does it mean? It means nothing. That's complete bullshit, right? And how does it help anyone when no concrete actions can follow? And that takes me to your question, right? EU is not ready and Ukraine is not ready. I mean, Adam can, can uh, elaborate on, on, on this, but uh, the EU is busy uh, penalizing Poland for this and that, right? The EU feels that the judicial reforms in Poland went too far and that the Polish government is the process of destroying the rule of law in, in Poland. Well, look at Poland and look at Ukraine. In my view, Ukraine will not be where Poland is now in 20 years. That's, that's a horrible thing to say because everyone loves Ukraine. I do too. Uh, but but the, you look at uh, the indicators of the levels of corruption that gives you some idea about the quality of governance and Ukraine is uh, just slightly above Russia. You look at the fact that the president of the highest court or something like that was just uh, 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 charged, right? Uh, with massive case of uh, corruption. So Ukraine uh, has the need for judicial uh, reforms that would uh, dwarf the challenges that the Polish government uh, faces, right? And, and Poland and Hungary today would probably not be admitted uh, as full members of the EU. So if the EU uh, really uh, follows the procedures that, that uh, uh, are in place currently, then Ukraine will need another 20, 30 years to live up to these expectations. And then uh, that, that's crazy. That's not going to fulfill the task of integrating Ukraine into uh, uh, the EU. So th uh, my view is that the EU needs to change. Ukraine needs to change, but the EU needs to change. And the EU needs to become less centralized, if you want, and more accommodating of a greater degree of diversity which that next enlargement would produce. I mean, we are talking about, I don't know, up to 35 member states with vastly different political cultures, histories, and levels of, of democratic governance and, and the levels of prosperity, et cetera. So this again worries me then when those outlandish promises are made about Ukraine being a part of Europe, but what realistic timeline is there for EU membership right even when when we, even at that moment that ukraine's status as an official applicant member was accepted president macron and remember the enlargement has to be endorsed by every single member state president macron cautioned that it will take a long time for ukraine uh, to be a member so yeah i i think that those representatives like charles michel and ursula von der leyen uh, should moderate their rhetoric and, and yeah, uh, less rhetorical gestures and more action, I think. Thanks, Stefan. Any other question? There was 
uh, was a reaction to your to your reply that Victoria wrote. It is exactly the way I thought. Thank you. But I just oh, follow, to follow if there is no other question on yeah. that on your reply. In Stefan, you you presented this different way of the conceptualization of future EU, EU, but but you didn't say us actually. What is yours? And is my question is, do you have uh, some model? of operation of EU, which is not super state, and at the same time is maybe not only intergovernmental type of the, of the organization. I, I personally believe that it would be better to uh, uh, repatriate uh, some powers to, to the nation state. So I, I kind of hinted at the fact that I would uh, support Morawiecki in his opposition to uh, you know, uh, the, the abolishment of unanimity requirement on foreign affairs and security uh, policies. Uh, but but to be perfectly honest, I realized that it is simply not possible to, to present a credible uh, vision because my vision has its limitations. How do you get back to that situation that would be like Europe before the Treaty of Maastricht, which I think would be a better Europe to have. Uh, how you can get there when you already have certain instruments in place that seem irreversible, like the single European currency. The single European currency necessitates a certain degree of integration uh, that is not even yet there. So I think that that there is a, an impasse, basically, that this the dysfunction that the EU suffers. And that's why my book is called the European Disunion, because the more uh, uh, these federalist ambitions that Europeans have had have been pursued, the more backlash uh, they uh, create. And, and my worry is, you know, the, the, the problem is like we, when we are looking at, at Ukraine and, and I am praying that they will push back Russians, you know, if we are lucky within months, it will be all over and the Russian army will just collapse and, and whatnot. And yet, when you really think critically about what has happened and what, what track record the EU has with enlargements, it's still not clear whether the enlargement would happen in the next 10, uh, 20 years, right? And like, just look at the Western Balkans and how long it, it takes to incorporate tiny countries like Serbia, right? So, yeah, and, and that is partly because uh, the EU that we currently have already is just so uh, thoroughly integrated that it, un it is understandable that it has such high demands on the prospective members. But yeah, the, 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 the current demands that it has Ukraine will not uh, uh, fulfill in the next 10, 20 years. That, that's my view. That might sound very pessimistic, but uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I would be delighted actually if someone challenged me. You, you, you are, there must be some uh, more optimistic uh, students there or, or, or graduate students or colleagues. We've got a uh, raise hand from Adrian's. Adrian's. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have the question regarding the book. Um, is it possible to get a signed copy from you from your latest book? You are sure, sure. I just don't know how I would send it to you. Oh. I, I would need to maybe, maybe when, when I visit uh, the campus. Yeah, we will organize something with Adam. Adam okay, to okay. To, to visit. I would try to this, uh, when, when uh, Adrian, when Stefan will be here, just contact us and uh, and. Yes. And uh, he will sign the copy. Um, is, uh, I am in the possession of the copy with a personal letter, right, from the from the author. So thanks very much, Stefan. Okay, sure. Any other Thank questions? Uh, if not, then uh, let me uh, express the gratitude to our speaker, Tech Stefan, for this uh, thoughtful and provocative at the same time. It means provoke the plenty of thoughts. I hope that we will we'll continue the discussion about these issues in the in the near future. And uh, and I also invite everybody for the next lectures. It means the next lecture will take place in June. 
It will be a totally different topic about the intellectual property rights and uh, given by the Adam Lieberman. And then in September, the last lecture given by, by Martin Krieger on uh, rule of law. So thanks, Stefan, and uh, uh, thanks again for accepting our invitation. I hope that was, uh, as you show in the discussion, that was a really uh, good response to your provocative thoughts. And uh, see you here, right, in RGSL. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and thank you all for, for engaging questions, comments, and, and I do hope that we will stay in touch and there will be an opportunity for me to visit the uh, campus. So good luck with all your studies. And we always see you in Hong Kong, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Oh, yes. If any of you have uh, uh, are heading into this part of the world, please, please send me a message. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for your bye -bye. time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.